The will of God is not just about becoming a preacher or being a minister. It's about discovering that unique purpose that God has got in your life. And every single one of us have been born to accomplish something amazing. I am really excited about sharing this because this is such a core value that we don't always uh, get to talk about in church life. But this is about uh, a deeper level in some ways, understanding why you're here, why you were born. This is called purpose. There is a lot on this matter, and I know that it's really going to help you uh, to understand exactly what God's got for your life. In John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That phrase, the Word, comes from a word saying, which is spelled logos, L-O-G-O-S. It was used by the Stoics, which was a philosophy that was uh, perpetrated by a number of people in, in that time, including Marcus Aurelius, who wrote a book called Meditations and how to be a Stoic person, somebody who dials down their emotional life and lifts up their reason to try and uh, navigate your way through, through life. And obviously they were involved in a lot of wars and so that assisted them. And that's where we get the word, that's a very Stoic person, meaning they're a little emotionally bland maybe and not uh, really given to uh, drama dramas in their life, but they just are reasonable and cool thinkers. Uh, but this, uh, this word that they used had never been used in religious language or in Jewish language before and, or in Christian language. But this word literally means, the word logos means the meaning or it means reason. And so this could read, in the beginning was the meaning and the meaning was with God and the meaning was God. Or it could also read, in the beginning was the reason, and the reason was with God, and the reason was God. So when we receive Christ and we are acquainted with God in heaven, we get acquainted with our meaning. We get acquainted with the meaning, the meaning of life. So John thought these guys are talking about the origin of everything coming from this thing called the meaning, which wasn't identified as a personality or a God. It was just a force. He said, I'll tell you, I'll take this word and tell you that the meaning was in the beginning. It was with God and it was God. And then down a little later in this chapter, he says, and the meaning became flesh and dwelt among us. And it was Jesus Christ full of grace and truth. And so when we understand that God himself is the meaning of life, that bringing him into our world clarifies why we're here and what we're meant to be doing. A little later on, Paul in the Bible, Paul prays in Ephesians 1.18, he says, I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding or heart be enlightened or opened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. That's, a, that's an awesome thing because it means the calling of God is good. It's got hope in it. It's not despair. When I was a youth leader, I remember talking to a young lady who, who would not yield her life to Christ, just would not bring her heart to God. And, and I said, well, why wouldn't you? He's good. She says, oh, I'm not sure about that. All I've ever been taught is that the will of God is hard and that anything I want to do, he, he won't want me to do that. He'll want me to do the things that I don't want to do. He's going to make me do stuff I, I'm no good at, that I can't do, and make me go where I hate, and, and it's just going to be a terrible, terrible life. So I'm not giving my life to Him. I would rather do my own thing. And I can understand that. If you think that God is capricious and mean and not out to, to bless you and to give you a great life, then it's difficult to say, here, I'm going to give you my life. But there is not a person born on this planet who isn't born with a, with, a, with a plan in their mind that God has put inside their genetic code, inside their heart. You came into this world with a blueprint that God has about your life. And it's a beautiful plan. Love has designed that plan. One of the ways I have discovered the will of God is following love. God is love. And so I find what I love is generally what God has taken me to. Now, I, now I'm, not, I'm not talking about just, you know, natural things like the blue Chevrolet or, you know, stuff like that. Could be though. And, uh, 
You know, I'm, I, when we got called to come to Australia, about five years before we came, we knew we were coming and we were building a house in New Zealand. I, I got a hold of 10 eucalyptus trees and planted them in the front of our house because I wanted it to be as much like Australia as I possibly could. I was in love with Australia even before I got here. Whenever I'd meet an Australian anywhere, I'd ask him a question and then just be quiet because I loved listening to the Australian accent. I just loved listening to them, to them say school and pool, whereas in New Zealand, we, we don't say it, we say school and pool. Uh, and and you, don't really, you, know, you don't really talk properly at all in New Zealand, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like you need a translator most of the time. The, but I found everything about uh, Australia I loved, and especially Sydney because I knew we were called here and we couldn't wait to get here. And, and I found myself in love with all the people, like the teenagers, like the, the married couples. I'd see guys uh, down on George Street, all these lawyers and bankers. And I thought, man, I, I just feel for you guys and married couples. And, and then I went on a missions trip to India and people said, oh, it's going to change your life, man. You know, you're going to, Ah, oh, it's going to break your heart when you see. And I, there were a lot of terrible, terrible things at that stage. This is like early 70s uh, that, that I saw there. But honestly, my heart didn't break. I wondered if I was even a Christian after a while. I thought, what? Am I, you know, am I, I, I should be feeling stuff for this. And, but I didn't. But when I landed in Australia, I started weeping. When I saw the guy with the mullet and his, and his wife, yeah, that's enough to weep about. And... Uh, <laughs> and a shopping trolley, and him and his wife are arguing, and there's a cattle dog in the back of the ute, arr, 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 and that, he's got one kid under his arm, going like, uh, this is a, and, that, that, and I'm, I'm weeping, going, oh God, I want to touch these lives. And that, that's the love of God in your heart. You will love being sent wherever God's going to send you. You will love doing, you will love the people that God sends you around and puts around your life. You will love doing the thing that, that you're called to do. When, when Jesus makes the invitation, he, he gives parables about the invitation. He says, come, come to the feast. It's always come to a party. And, and then they made excuses and some said, oh, I got to go, I got two oxen, I got to go try them out. And uh, one said, oh, I've bought a field, I've got to go and try it out, you know, test it. Another one said, I've been engaged. Um, the analogy stops there actually. And, uh, you know, just, just, but there are excuses. I got to say goodbye to my parents. I got to go, go through the whole long, elongated family thing. And, uh, and so there was all these reasons why, Jesus, why these people said, we can't come. But it mystified Jesus in a way. He, he said, it's a party. I'm inviting you to a feast. The will of God is not an onerous task. David said, I delight to do your will, O God. He had discovered that God is good and that his plan for you is exciting. Uh, whenever I've made plans for my kids for a holiday, you know, when, when they were young, they they found it just one of the most exciting things because we'd sit down and we'd talk about it. And uh, one of the trips we organized, I'd been asked to speak at a, a conference in California. And so I was being paid for to go there. And, and I decided we'd save our pennies and take the whole family and go up to some ski fields afterwards. And, uh, and so this was six months before and we showed the kids pictures and we said, yeah, we're going to go here and be on the big jet plane and all this kind of thing. Well, for the next six months, Joseph, who was only about eight at that age, he was holding on to my pants everywhere I'd go around the house. He says, you, you're not leaving, are you? You're not going without me. And he was like, for, for months, every, every time I go out the door, he says, you, you're coming home, aren't you? You know, you're, you're not going to leave us here. You're not going to go on this holiday without us. He was excited about the plans I had for him. I'm excited about the plans my Father in heaven has got for us in the future. They're good. They're not evil. He's planned blessing for you. Any good father will do that. And so Jesus keeps on inviting. And when they made excuses, he says, oh, well, let anybody come. And uh, that makes me realize that when he does call you, there may have been some others that he tried first. I'm probably like number 20 on the list. 
You know, there's a few others, like Gabriel's Michael are up there saying, oh, look, he's a really intelligent, well-equipped guy. You know, he's, he's got talents, he's got skills, lots of experience. Ah, oh, no, I can't do it. I've got other agendas on. Got big things uh, in my life in store. So they go down this whole list. And, they, and then Gabriel says, God, um, the, the last one on the list is, uh, is Phil, Phil Pringle. God, oh, no, really? Uh, you know, uh, do we, uh, yeah, all right, let's give him a go. And uh, I don't know if it's like that at all, but it does tell me that some are called and then maybe they didn't quite respond like he wanted them to. And so there, are, there is a call of God that we are born with. And there is a plan that God has for your life. And this is possibly the most important part of this message right now. There is a plan. You do have a destiny. But it's not going to happen unless you surrender to the Lord. And you say, God, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to surrender to the will of God no matter what it is. I'm not going to withhold and hold on to my life and do what I want to do. I'm going to surrender to the will of God. How many are glad that Michelangelo didn't try to be a, a banker or a commercial guy? And now we've got this beautiful Sistine Chapel ceiling showing the history of the Bible and the creation. And it's lasted the ages. Still yells every day to millions of people around the world. On the wall of every Italian restaurant, you'll find some aspect of Michelangelo's Great painting. I mean, Handel wrote the, Handel's Messiah. Beautiful music. Eric Liddell, when I run, I feel the pleasure of God. The will of God is not just about becoming a preacher or being a minister. It's about discovering that unique purpose that God has got in your life. And every single one of us have been born to accomplish something amazing. Even if it's raising our children, as mothers, mothers can be thinking, well, I don't know that my, I've got this enormous destiny or whatever. Imagine if Susanna Wesley had thought that, thought, oh, I'll just leave these kids to do whatever they like. But she raised 19 children, for goodness sake. I mean, she was like a, a literal factory. And uh, here, she, here she is with these two boys, John and Charles Wesley, who changed the world. Jochebed, who had enough faith to put Moses in a basket in the river. And he's found by Pharaoh's daughter. This woman, Jochebed, was, was a woman of faith, a mother of faith. And she ends up raising that boy and getting paid for it because of her great faith as a mother, as a father. Sometimes as a husband, we can feel inadequate and not ready for the job. But if we accept this is part of the call, part of the destiny that God has got on your life, you can reach out to Him and He'll put inside of you a power that'll enable you to be the best dad, the best husband you, you could possibly be. 2 Timothy 3.10 says, But you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. Paul's, Paul's call, the call to Paul, was probably the most dramatic in the Bible. He's got a deep hatred for Christians. They offend him because he is a devoted Jewish Pharisee. And he is completely dedicated to his religion so much so that he wants to kill or imprison any opponents. And so he is on his way on the road to Damascus to actually kill or imprison Christians. And Jesus appears to him and says, Paul, what are you, Saul, what are you doing? He says, well, who are you? He says, I'm Jesus, I'm Lord. Who are you persecuting? He says, no, 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 I'm persecuting Christians. He says, same thing. You heard them, you heard me. It's me. You're kicking against something on the inside of you. You're angry, you're upset that it wasn't you who got this big move, that it wasn't you who's, who, uh, your, your religion, that God didn't come through the ways that you had thought he should and would that all the history books said he would. And now here he is, and it's aggravating you. He said, you need to follow me. And right there on the spot, he bowed his knee and said, okay, Lord, whatever you want. He did a 180 turnaround. And suddenly he was building the very church he was trying to destroy. Straight away, he became deeply converted. That's what, that's what conversion is all about. And he got a calling on the day of his conversion. 
A lot of us can take time to understand what the call of God is. When you get saved, Jesus has saved you, but He wants you to take another step and make Him Lord. We can't just stay at the cross getting saved all the time. Help me, Jesus. Heal me. Help me through this. Get rid of this. And, and I want to overcome this. That's good. But, but that's, <clears throat> that's baby Christianity, just staying there. He wants you to take another step and say, He's going to be the Lord of my life. I'm going to make Him the Lord of my lifestyle, my calendar, my finances, my relationships. He's going to rule over all these areas. So I make choices that He wants. And this is, this is just the general will of God. Every time you turn up at church, you're putting your life on the altar. Every time you bring your tithes, you're putting your finances on the altar. Every time you worship God together with other people, you're putting your relationships on the altar with God. And it's on that altar that blessing falls, that the fire of God is going to fall. And every time we consecrate ourselves in this general call of God, we have the opportunity for it to be clarified more clearly about what we personally are meant to be doing. And you'll find that the call of God, it comes in all kinds of ways. Like, like for Samuel, it came when he was a little boy, maybe 8, 10, 11 years old in the, in the temple. He was in the house. And, and then it came to Abraham, not when he's a little boy, but when he's old, like 75. It came to women, it came to men, it came to teenagers like Mary. I want you to bring the Son of God into the world. And so Mary yielded. When God can see a heart that will agree with His purpose, He'll visit you and He'll call on you to do things, things that you are not even equipped to do. But He will anoint you and give you the equipment, give you the adequacy to actually make it happen. I mean, there's a lot of excuses in the Bible. What people, you know, when they, when they said, oh, we, we can't come. The rich young ruler said, I'm oh, too busy with my money. Uh, others with family stuff, business. Some didn't have the courage. And, and then there were others who just, just kind of rebelled. Just, oh, I'm holding out. I, I don't want to do that. And, and the sooner we can break that, the better. The sooner we can say, Lord, I was born for a purpose. I really want to know what that purpose is because I will do it. It doesn't matter what you ask me to do. I'm ready to fulfill the will of God for my life. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I love this. that it, He says, I want you to present your bodies. I mean, it, it kind of, irked me. It's, it, when I first started reading the Bible and I read that, I thought, wouldn't you mean hearts? Present your hearts to God or present your soul or present your spirit to God. And it says bodies. That's a very physical thing, God. But then I realized that wherever your body is, your heart, soul, and spirit are too. But I found some people will say, hey, can't make it this Sunday, but my spirit's with you, you know. I don't, I don't want your spirit. Bring your body down. And uh, uh, I, it, is, it is good to be with people in spirit, but way better when it's with your body and your body's active and involved. I have, it, looking through the scripture, it is impossible to find God calling anybody who wasn't busy at the time. Everybody was busy. They had a reason to not get involved because they're busy. Elisha, he's plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. And Elijah calls him. He could have said, hey, I've got a few fields to finish first. He immediately drops it. Jesus has come to the fishermen. Follow me. They drop their nets. He says, sure, we're with you. To the guys mending the nets. Sure. To Matthew sitting at tax collecting. See, come, follow me. Yeah, sure. Here we go. All the way through Scripture, God doesn't call lazy people because doing the will of God is work. And, and it's not like, it's not like you can say, oh, I want to do the will of God. I'm just going to sit around home watching midday television. And when the call of God comes, then I'll get busy. It, if we're busy now in the middle of our schedule, our world, He's going to speak into us and we, we can change direction, maybe to complete and keep on doing the things that we're doing. But the will of God is not a passive thing. When, when, when you hear the message, you've got a destiny, the real meaning of that word destiny is hard work. You've got a hard work. Amen. 
you, you've got a, you got a lot of, you got a lot to do, a lot of busyness getting active. Don't be thinking the grace of God's going to fulfill your destiny for you. I can't fulfill your destiny for you. Nobody else can except you. And when you, I'm going to put my life on the altar. I call it aggressive submission. Because when I pray that I will be done on earth, I'm not, I'm not just going to sit back and passively wait. Somehow it's all going to happen. When I pray that I will be done on earth, it's a prayer as much as to motivate me to make that will happen in earth by bringing it to pass and implementing it. I don't know anybody achieving anything great for God who doesn't also work hard. Philippians 3.14 says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. But here's the thing. You know, uh, I've, I, like recently, we came back from three weeks holiday. And, and I, holidays are great. But I can't take a holiday if I haven't been working hard. I don't feel good sitting on a beach doing nothing if that's what I was doing three months before as well. And, you know, just hanging around. You kind of feel, okay, this is, you know, I've earned this. And, and that's good. But then after about two weeks... I don't know about you, I'm getting a little itchy. I'm getting cabin fever and kind of clawing up the walls. You know, get a little short and want to get over the meals quick. And, and then you're looking forward to getting home. Some people ask me, what's, what's the best airplane flight in the world? I say the one home and uh, the one that gets you back. But as soon as we landed, I had a really big week because that's what happens when you're away. You got all this other stuff. But I can tell you this, there's not a second of it that I don't love that I don't enjoy. I find that doing the will of God is energizing. It's not depleting. When you're not doing the will of God, when you're not doing your purpose, that's when you're going to get fatigue. You get it weary and confused and you don't know where you're going, what you're meant to be doing. And the glorious thing about knowing what you're meant to do, it also clarifies what you're not meant to do. And that's a great thing to be able to say, well, I just don't do that. I'm not going to be feeling... I'm, manipulated, obligated, guilt-driven to do a bunch of other things. This is what I'm called to do, and I'm going to do it, and there's energy in that. You'll find yourself smiling in the work, in the workroom, in the meetings, in the whatever it is that God has called you to do. It's enjoyable and it's nourishing. Romans 11.29 says the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Once you've got it, it's never going to be taken away. Whatever gift and callings you've got on your life, nothing you do can remove them. They are locked into your genetic code, locked into your whole life. It's not that we, they get us into heaven. Gifts and calling don't get us into heaven, but they equip us here on earth to do the things that the Lord's called us to do. Matthew 22, 14, many are called, but few are chosen. So I'm just about to jump into the story of a, of a guy called Jeremiah, who was chosen by God. Many might have been called, but this guy got chosen. Why, what is that? What, what's the difference? The difference is Romans 12, 1, present yourselves a living sacrifice, acceptable to God. You're ready. You've been to C3 College. You're ready. You've been a connect group leader. You're ready. You've been an assistant connect group leader. You're ready. To, you're available. You're, you're doing something that has put you in a place where you've been trained. You're getting ready to fulfill the thing that God's put in your heart. And when you do with your hand what your hand can do, you find you're able to do what's in your heart. That burden that's on the inside of you. And so that word many are called few are chosen. The word chosen there is more like choosable. It's more like pickable, or if you're from New Zealand, choice. And uh, many are called, few are choice, eh, bro? And uh, whew, these apples are really good, eh? Yeah, that choice, eh? Yeah. <laughs> whew. <laughs> you want some kai, hey? Yeah. My, uh, my friends from New Zealand. How many people from New Zealand here? Yeah, see, they could all understand me. The rest of you just didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> okay, so, so your choice, hey? And the reason your choice is because you're ready, you're ripe. You don't pick every apple off the tree, some are green, they're not ready. 
But those that are ripe, many are called, but few are ready for picking. Few are ready for that moment where God can get a hold of you and actually use you. And Jeremiah was obviously like that. In Jeremiah 1, 4, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Guys, this is like unbelievable. To me, I, it staggers me. Before I formed you, it isn't just scientific processes. It's not bad science to say God formed us in the womb, intimately. He was connected with your formation. It blows my mind the fact that I even can acknowledge that I exist. When I think about who is I, I know that's bad grammar, but it works for me. Who is I? I mean, how, how did I get to be here and know that I'm here? And no, I'm not you and you know you're not me and I'm aware that I'm here. That's not something that evolves over billions of years of foggy self-awareness. Oh, you know, I'm kind of aware I'm here, you know, but I've got another couple of billions of years and then I'll be really aware, you know. No, you're aware in this one life that you're here. You, are, you have been created by a creator. So now you're aware. I'm here for goodness sake. You once didn't exist. You had no awareness, no consciousness, but he formed that and now you have that. This is the quality of God that you can say I am. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God didn't just know you, he loved you. That's why he made you. He wouldn't have made you if he didn't love you. He thought of you and wow, I'd love one of those. I haven't got one of those. I'm going to make me one of those. And now here you are. But it wasn't just one, it was billions of people showering out of his thoughts like sparks. Every one he thought of, angels sang, choirs roared through the heavens, orchestras played. It was a beautiful creation in God's mind. He said, I'm going to give them a plan. A purpose. I'm so excited about this. He's more excited about our plan than we are about our plan. He's jumping up and down saying, oh, this is going to be awesome. You're going to have so much fun. <laughs> he said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you before you were born. I sanctified you and I chose you to be a prophet to the nations. Then I said, oh God, I can't speak. I'm too young. All of us think we're too something. But you're not too anything. You're not too married. You're not too mortgaged. You're not too young. You're not too old. You're not too worn out. You're not too... God, when you don't believe in yourself, God still believes in you. He says, you do not say I'm too young. You'll go to all who I send you. And then as he goes through this, the musicians can come right now. When he says in verse 11, he says, I'm going to send you out. And you're going to have this amazing impact on the nations. You're going to root out, pull down, destroy, plant, and build. You and I have been called to do exactly that. To bring down strongholds in spiritual heavenly places. And we've also been called to build churches and plant new ones. And that is exactly what we as a congregation have to identify as part of the meaning and the calling that God has gifted us with. The meaning of us being together, the meaning of my life, the meaning of all of us being in this place together is that we will pull together in unity and fulfill a purpose, a destiny that God has called us to together. In Jesus' name, amen. And it's happening. Without any doubt, it's happening. But then in verse 11, the Lord says to Jeremiah, what do you see? And he says, I see, a, I see the branch of an almond tree. He says, you've seen well because I'm about ready to fulfill my word. An almond tree, what's that? Well, the almond tree blossoms one month earlier than all the other trees. In that part of the world, it's April instead of May. It comes early. What God was saying in some translations, put it like this, I'm accelerating my word to fulfill it. And let me tell you today, as you sit here, the Holy Spirit is going to blow into this, into this congregation and begin accelerating every promise, every dream, every vision that we have projected all over the city. The hour is late. The door of the end of time is starting to close. And you and I are involved in one of the most magnificent 
important programs in the face of the earth and in all history. And that's the building of the end time church filled with the glory of God. And he says, I'm going to accelerate this. I'm going to speed things up, people. It isn't going to slow down and dribble off to some insignificant ending. The church is going to get larger and larger, more stronger and stronger until she is standing in all the earth as the mighty, powerful God of heaven's church, bringing healing, deliverance, miracles throughout all the earth. And you will find that you are part of this acceleration, part of this increased move of God. Come on, let's all stand up and give the Lord a great clap offering. Here as we close, Lord Jesus, we will bless and we will magnify and we will glorify your everlasting and your holy name. There is no one like you, O oh God, in all the heavens, in all the earth. Let the blessing and the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit grip us and take us forward in Jesus' mighty name.